All right. Well, let's get started, shall we? Welcome everyone to our concurrent session. This one is the zero waste approach to wildland fire response. In this session, we're going to hear about the camps that pop up to fight wildfires and the approaches being implemented now and those to come in the emerging field of sustainable emergency response. My name is Jeremy Drake. I'm a certified zero waste associate and instructor with Zero Waste USA and a Missoula, Montana based zero waste consultant working across the country with my colleagues at Zero Waste Associates. Um, the two speakers in this session, Hannah Johnson and Kelly Jaramillo, will tell us about their experiences working to implement policies and programs to reduce resource use impacts of wildfire response. So following their presentation, you'll have the opportunity to do Q&A like we've done in some other sessions, uh, but please feel free to pop any questions you have in the chat as we go along. Uh, I'm going to start with some introductions, um, and then we will jump into the presentations. So I'm going to start with Hannah. Human Eco Consulting is a woman-owned small business based out of Seattle, Washington. Led by founder Hannah Johnson, Human Eco focuses on designing net zero waste strategic frameworks and program implementation pathways for technology corporations and government entities. Hannah has direct experience with leading the initial intake of zero waste planning with large and small scale entities to the ultimate adoption, program design, implementation, and tracking. And Kelly, who's going to be our first presenter today, Kelly Jaramillo, has served as the Forest Service Region 3 Sustainable Operations Program Lead for the past six years. That's Arizona and New Mexico. She has supported the National Greening Fire Team for the past four years and currently serves as chairperson. She has helped transition this team from its grassroots beginnings to a chartered entity under the Forest Service Washington Office Fire and Aviation Management. The team's keystone deliverable over the past three years has been their first of its kind multi geographic area blanket purchase agreement for on-site incident recycling services. We're gonna hear a lot more about that from Kelly. So thank you all for being here and Kelly, take it away. Okay, great. Well, uh, hello everyone. I'm Kelly Jaramillo, as Jeremy mentioned, and I'm speaking from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I'm here to share a slice of our National Greening Fire Team's pursuit to achieve zero waste with wildland fire operations. Our National Greening Fire Team's vision is to achieve net zero environmental impact at all large fire incidents by 2030. We do this by conserving energy and water, reducing fuel consumption and emissions, green procurement, and reducing waste on fires. We often refer to a wildland fire as an incident. In the picture on the top right, you can see a photo that I took on the river complex fire in Northern California this past August. This is an example of an incident command post. The picture on the left was shared with me from a night shift firefighter that was on the same fire. So let's go to a fire camp together. Imagine you're camping in a tent in a place where daytime temperatures can be well over 100 degrees. Dust, ash, and smoke are everywhere. Nearly everyone assigned to the fire is working 16 hour days every day. Teams typically rotate every 14 days. And because fires can move, your entire camp may need to relocate at any point. Fighting wildland fires can require less than 100 or well over 1,000 firefighters and support personnel over just a few days on a small fire or months on a very large fire. Incidents may be near urban areas with convenient access to trash and recycling outlets or in very remote locations. Fire camps often include tents and yurts like those that you see here. Food and supplies are often arriving in cardboard boxes and they're usually crates of bottled water and sports drinks. Sometimes firefighters and other resources operate from what we call a spike or a remote camp 
that may be an hour or more away from the main camp in hard to reach places that may or may not even have cell phone signal, but that still require meals, supplies, and trash to be managed. When a fire occurs, how long it lasts and the amount of resources that will be required are extremely difficult to predict. So when we discuss greening fire, you can imagine the complexity of trying to reduce waste, for example, on incidents across such a wide spectrum of circumstances. So are you ready to help me reduce waste on fires? Let's do this. In the past, we tried to reduce trash through impromptu recycling on incidents, but we struggled with heavy contamination, inadequate recycle bins and signs, lack of staffing, and a lack of knowledge tied to where and how to take the recyclables to the closest recycle outlet. Our National Green Fire Team was determined to solve these issues by creating a turnkey incident recycling contract vehicle with standardized recycling equipment, signs and processes, highly qualified vendors and cost-effective waste diversion services. So in federal contracting language, we launched what is called a Blanket Purchase Agreement, or BPA, in 2019. There are multiple vendors on the BPA. As you can see on the slide, the BPA requires the vendors to do a whole lot more than simply just drop off a cardboard recycling dumpster at the fire camp. The vendors are required to provide trash and recycle stations throughout the fire camp and service them to prevent overflow. The vendors are also required to transport all of the recyclables to an appropriate recycle outlet, as well as document their waste diversion data. It was important to us that our program be professional, transparent, and accountable. So we developed data tools for mandatory reporting of the trash and recycle quantities. Lastly, our recycling vendors are required to provide a final written waste diversion report that not only summarizes the waste and recycling data, but also provides insights into the challenges that they encountered, lessons learned, and opportunities for improvement so that our National Green Fire Team can use these reports to continuously improve our program in the future. And because this was our first large-scale pilot of this service, we limited the geographic scope to California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, and New Mexico. So let's take a look at a few incident recycling examples. I was actually on this fire, the Bighorn, near Tucson, Arizona in 2020. The recycling vendor, Meadowhawk Recycling, provided on-site recycling services for 34 consecutive days and achieved an average diversion rate of 33%. This fire involved two different incident command posts, a spike camp, and an average of 675 people per day. On this fire, as you can see in the photo, we saw the impact and the challenge of two-go style meals in the waste stream. On the Slater Devil Fire in Northern California and Southern Oregon in 2020, the recycling vendor, Human Eco, and the incident management teams diverted over 37,000 pounds of materials and achieved a 43% waste diversion rate. Importantly, the incident recycling vendor managed the donation of 3,600 pounds of non-perishable foods to the local community something that can be particularly valuable when the community is in crisis. You probably heard about the Dixie Fire near Quincy, California this year. The recycling vendor, Zero Hero, provided on-site services for over three months straight with an incident management headcount ranging from 1,300 to 1,800 people per day. Zero Hero pointed out in their final report that Quincy is a town of 1,900 people. Three dumpsters service the whole town. An incident of this size produces two to three times the amount of waste normally produced by the town. All three drivers were evacuated from their homes and one lost their home. Providing communities like these with more comprehensive emergency waste diversion services alleviates the strain on the town and its community members. Zero Hero diverted nearly 157,000 pounds of material from going to community landfills. This included diverting non-perishable, uneaten food to local evacuee support networks and diverting unwanted fresh produce to, to feed rescued animals. It's estimated that the team saved almost $147,000 in avoided landfill hauling costs through this recycling program. 
We have a very cool video about this on our website and I hope you'll check it out. On the Jack Fire near Glide, Oregon, the recycling vendor Triple Flare provided on-site recycling services for 92 consecutive days and diverted just over 79,000 pounds of material from going to the landfill. On this fire, the local waste hauler did not have enough drivers to provide more than one 30 yard dumpster for the incident. Luckily, the recycling vendor was able to also provide mobile trash compactor service. This combined with careful sorting and recycling meant that the single dumpster was actually adequate for the 500 plus people that were on site every day for nearly three months. The waste diversion services are estimated to have saved $45,000 in avoided trash hauling costs. The Antelope Fire in Northern California had as few as 200 people and as many as 1,100 people at a time. The on-site recycling vendor, Human Eco, serviced this fire for just over two months and diverted roughly 45,000 pounds of material. On the top left, you can see a photo of recyclables taken to REACH Incorporated, a nonprofit in Klamath Falls, Oregon, that provides employment and day programs for adults living with disabilities or barriers to employment. Our website also has a video about this, and I hope you'll check that out as well. We received very welcome feedback from the field that the recycling vendors helped make the fire camp feel more clean and well-organized. In addition, by diverting recyclables out of the waste stream, as we've pointed out already, we estimate that we can save between 50 and 80% trash hauling costs on incidents. For me, it's exciting to see feedback from the public on Facebook like, this is wonderful. I always hated the waste that went on in fire camp. Thank you so much. My son's school received a large donation of food snacks left over from the fire. Way to give to the local communities. Importantly, we've also received similar feedback from our own fire personnel who really appreciate the program and the opportunity to participate in reducing waste. You can see from the dashboard screenshot on the left that the on-site recycling services were provided on 31 fires in 2021. The vendors documented 621,000 pounds of material that were diverted from community landfills. This is a relatively new program and recycling is obviously not ordered on all incidents, partly because we need more vendors that can provide on-site recycling. We're looking to expand services potentially nationwide in 2022. So if you or your company uh, or someone that you know of uh, may have the capability to provide on-site recycling services, please complete our market research survey. It's uh, on the link on this slide so that we can have your contact information. And recycling is just one piece of our waste reduction journey. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Hannah to share the broader net zero waste strategy. All right, awesome. Wow, that really took me right back to summer being at the camps. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, uh, my name's Hannah Johnson. I am the founder of Human Eco, and I am one of the vendors on the Recycling BPA. So I was out there in the field for most of the summer, uh, managing a lot of the waste that was coming off fires, which is just, um, yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's pretty rewarding, crazy, thrilling work. So with that, we've kind of moved and shift focus into a new scope of work, which is a 2030 net zero waste design and assessment. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, but first I just wanna highlight as Kelly has just brought so much attention to that recycling has been a huge piece to bringing awareness to just how much waste is generated on these incidents. Um, without the recycling BPA, a lot of the material was just out of sight, out of mind, ending up in bins and sent to the landfill. So really recycling has given us a snapshot into what the opportunity looks like to reduce waste upstream. And also it's building momentum for people to get involved and to really participate in this work. So it's, it's really, really quite great. Um, and I wanted to show the zero waste hierarchy. I'm sure most of you have seen this, um, but recycling and compost really falls into this middle category. So it's still a form of downstream materials management that doesn't really cut to the source of how much material is being produced and ordered on incidents. And so the net zero waste contract is really meant to shift our thinking up in the hierarchy into more of this reimagining, redesigning space uh, to ultimately 
um, produce a, a reduction in overall waste generated. And as Kelly mentioned, you know, even, even the materials that are being recycled from these incidents are in such large volume that a lot of these smaller rural communities just don't have the infrastructure to support it. And so while we're doing something good with recycling, it still does become a burden to local communities that we really want to ease and figure out better solutions for um, with this contract work. So the net zero waste design and assessment is a, the goal is to produce a detailed roadmap to achieve net zero waste incident operations by 2030. So our goal is to kind of start implementing some of these practices in the next, um, the next BPA cycle and to iterate over time so that we can really build something that is developed and sustainable and rooted in long-term achievements. So we really wanna see zero waste in the next 10 years. And what this involves is, of course, analyzing the supply chain. So we really have to understand, you know, what are the materials absolutely needed on an incident? Where are those materials coming from? How are they used? So just mapping overall material movement and use from start to finish on an incident. And also understanding the stakeholders. So who, who is the decision makers in what to purchase, how to purchase, how much of something to purchase. Um, we really wanna make sure that they're part of the conversation around design so that it really is a collaborative approach uh, that everybody's involved with. We're also gonna be researching and identifying regional recycling infrastructure. So as mentioned, a lot of the, the recycling is happening locally. So in these small communities where the incidents are. Um, but we want to pull that out and we want to really develop larger scale regional approaches to a hub and spoke recycling model. And with that also identifying partnerships. And the way we're thinking about partnerships is it really encourages more innovative thinking um, and really provides value to getting these products that would typically end up in the landfill uh, into more upstream solutions through those partnerships. And then while we're able to see what's generated on incidents, we also are doing a series of waste audits at the interagency caches. And what a cache is, I just learned this being on this project um, and getting to visit them is just quite an experience. But a cache is basically this large warehouse space that has full-time and part-time employees that are just managing the materials needed to support incidents. And so caches are um, positioned regionally and there's multiple levels of caches and sizes, um, but basically they will intake a lot of the newer materials from the GSA, the purchasing catalog, they'll inventory everything. And then when an incident pops up in a region, that incident will place an order through the cache for what they need to support that fire. So the cache will then pull the inventory, package everything up, send it out. So it's a, it's a really key um, materials movement out the door to support incidents, but it also works as a space where once an incident has finished and they're demobilizing or you know, sending it back all the supplies, chainsaws, fire hose, generators, batteries, everything comes back to the cache uh, after an incident. And then the cache is sort of overwhelmed with all this material that they have to figure out what to do with and how to sort. Um, so these caches are really becoming a, a centralized point for us in this design framework to think about uh, material movement and um, material pathways. So we've done three of the five waste audits that we've signed up for on this design assessment. We've been in um, Colorado, Oregon, and Northern California. And we're starting to notice a pattern, which, um, which is great for, for design purposes, because there are specific materials that we really want to target as big hitters um, with this work, kind of first and foremost. So starting on the left here, we have batteries. Um, batteries are used at an astounding rate on incidents. And so when, when the batteries are used, they get piled up, um, thrown in buckets and sent back to the cache. And then the cache is sort of left with these pallets of batteries that they have to sort through. And they have to sort out lithium from alkaline and they have to prepare everything and they have to find a recycler. So these batteries um, end up being a time consuming task and also take up space in the caches. And so we wanna look in this des design assessment at um, strategic partnerships around battery recycling, but also around um, reducing the use of batteries altogether and thinking through reusable solutions. The middle category here is camping gear. So we have tents, sleeping bags, um, Nomex, which is the yellow and green wild and firefighter outfits. And um, this, 
this gets checked out on incident by the wildland firefighters and used and then sent back to the cache. And a lot of times minor repairs are needed on this equipment to get it back in use again. But just from the sheer time that that takes and the overwhelming amount of work that these caches have, um, it, it's something that tends to get uh, put aside or left behind. And this material, we did see a lot of it in the landfill bound waste stream. And then um, our biggest culprit here on the right is fire hose. Um, so this is 44 pallets of fire hose or close to 60,000 pounds of fire hose that's been tested at the cache. It's been determined that it doesn't meet spec for reuse and it's now just waiting for a place to go. Um, the caches are really trying to keep it out of the landfill, but ultimately if it sits for too long and we can't find outlets, it has to go. Um, it's taking up a lot of space. So that is another huge commodity that we're looking at um, solutions for. And so our, our thinking really in the partnership sphere in the materials just mentioned is to find partners that can really support um, having a continual feedstock of materials that they can do something with. So the partnership here on the left is a, a partnership that was with Hose to Habitat, which is a nonprofit organization that would connect feedstock of fire hose to zoos. And then those zoos would intake the fire hose and use it as sanctuary enhancements for the animals. And it's a really cool partnership um, it, it's definitely one of those feel good um, solutions, but we ran into an issue here with scale. You know, there's so much with climate change and how long these incidents are and how much materials are coming off. Um, a, a small nonprofit can really only handle so much. And so um, we've, we've sort of overwhelmed them and we're at a pause with that partnership. And that's why the hoses are now backing up the caches. So when we're thinking about partnerships, we really want to diversify um, and address scalability and capacity first and foremost in the conversations. So we're looking to things like, you know, building material reuse, furniture. Um, and then what's not mentioned on this slide is manufacturer take back. And that really is a piece to this puzzle that it's, it's really, really important. And the awesome thing about working on this contract is that it's such a new space. This conversation is so new for this organization that we are going to attempt to have those conversations. We're reaching out to hose manufacturers. We're reaching out to Nomex manufacturers. And we're asking them you know, what the opportunities for sustainability and partnership look like. Um, and one of the biggest barriers, of course, is just infrastructure. A lot of the manufacturers don't have the infrastructure to take in and wash and break down the hose to, to remanufacture it. Um, but that's definitely something that we want to push in our thinking and, and our creation on this project. So we've been at this since July of 2021 um, amidst fire season, which was totally nuts to kind of manage both things. But um, what we're seeing is that we really do want to think about this regionally and we want to build really strong and strategic um, pathways for the materials that are generated on incidents to have a second life. Um, so as you can see on the left here, each cache is located in a geographic location that supports the incidents that happen in those geographic locations. So ideally what we want to do is have a really strong network that both the incident themselves and the cache can utilize. So materials could be um, used on an incident and then prepared and get sent directly out for repurpose or recycling from the incident rather than overwhelming the cache or if a material needs to go back to the cache for testing and refurbishment, it can still do that. But then if the cache can't use it, they can send it directly out as well. So we just really wanna open up and clear out these pathways um, so that the material doesn't backlog, thus rendering it as just get it out of the way, put it in the landfill. So we're really thinking through that. Um, and all the while, you know, with the, the main goal guiding this, which is just that all materials used on an instant have an afterlife out of community landfills and out of incinerators. Um, because at the end of the day, this is very valuable material. And, um, you know, this conference is just pointing to the fact that we need to really start thinking about this as a resource. Um, and that's what we're hoping to do here. So with that, uh, if you want to get involved at all, there is a lot of opportunity. Um, I'll let Kelly speak a little bit more in a minute about ways to get involved on her side. On my side, um, if you have an idea or a connection for any of the materials that I've mentioned on these slides, uh, please reach out. We're currently talking with companies all over the country um, about solutions around fire hose um, and Nomex and camping gear and, and repair opportunity. 
Um, and again, it's at scale. So just kind of thinking about that, but reach out if you have any ideas there. And then also if you're interested on getting on a wildland fire and actually doing the recycling work, um, we will be a part of the 2022 RFP process. So we'll be applying there and hopefully getting out again. So you can track us on the website. And Kelly, if there's any more opportunity you wanna share, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Hannah. Great job, Hannah. I just wanted to share that I did post in the chat um, a link to our National Green Fire Team website, as well as a link to the survey. So if you can push that link out to anybody that you know in your network that might be able to respond, we're hoping to get you know 20 to 30 companies at least if we can. So I would really like to get more companies involved. And um, I saw that Catherine Como had a chat um, comment that she's here to learn more about uh, trying to apply this program for hurricane um, and response and recovery efforts in Louisiana, Lafayette. So really, really glad to see you, Catherine. I was out on Hurricane Katrina when I was still in the military. So I'm really familiar with um, all the waste that happens after a major hurricane. But I, I hope that you see some applications of what we're doing. Yeah, thank you both, Kelly and Hannah. I'm going to invite everybody to um, shift to gallery mode here in the upper right hand corner. Click the view button and move over to gallery mode. Feel free to turn on your video. Um, we're going to go a little more conversational in the last few minutes of this session before we return to the main stage. Um, and feel free to turn on your video if you have a question you want to ask. I um, I have one question kind of connected to the uh, couple of the earlier sessions today for Hannah and, and possibly for Kelly. What about reuse systems for food service uh, uh, at fire camps? Is there any conversation about that? Um, I'll, I'll start really quick. So yeah, food is definitely huge. A lot of uh, Kelly's slides show clamshells in the dumpsters. So a lot of it's currently single use. Uh, my dream vision would be to have uh, some of these uh, reuse solutions on a fire camp actually running reusable dishware services. Um, Pre-COVID, firefighters were required to dine in, um, in a dining tent. So it's all contained and it would be really manageable to do um, a reusable dish service there. Um, with COVID, folks have been able to take their clamshells all over the camp, which is a nightmare for us as the recyclers to try to get a hold of all those. So yeah, definitely thinking in the realm of reuse as a big opportunity. Terrific. Kelly, yeah, do you want I mean, to respond to that? Yeah, just to add to that, we're absolutely looking into, like you know, Hannah was trying to get to, that we have to address that if we want to get to net zero, period. We have to figure it out. But when you think about like all the presentations that we're seeing so far, people are, you know, we did see some from sporting events, but a lot, you know, there's a centralized location in a building where people can go to and you can manage waste in an office or in a community. And with these, with the emergency response world, you got to think about dishwashing systems that are mobile. How do you take that dishwashing and go mobile? And then with the reuse, you know, if you've got people at a spike camp that are an hour away, you need to get them a hot meal and you don't want their meal to end up all over the place inside a box and squished against other plates of food. You know, how do you even transport hot food to 200 people that are in a remote location? And, and then what do you do with it? So this it's very complicated um, to try and solve, but we're looking at all the options that are out there and we're hoping that we can pull best practices that cities are doing all over the world right now with you know the to go space. Yeah. And and the event events too seem like could be there could be some good practices in, in large scale events. Uh, we have just one minute to go. I'm going to share the state, the main stage link there again. Rachel, did you have a question you wanted to throw out there we, that we can leave in the ether before we all um, depart? I really don't. This was pretty new to me. So I, I appreciate all you're doing. It's very exciting work. I'm racking my brain for who to talk to in Colorado to send your information out to. Terrific. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Hannah, for a wonderful session. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all back in the main stage. We've got our second keynote speaker of the day today, Paul Connett, author of The Zero Waste Solution and a real engaging speaker. So hope to see you all back there in just a moment. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye.